Well, happy Monday, everyone. Welcome to the James Galliard Show. This is James Galliard. I'm here every Monday with you on Choice FM from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. talking uh, politics and culture and news and sports and religion. Basically anything to get us talking about things that lead to a greater conversation. My objective here when I'm with you every Monday is not that you agree with everything that I say, but my objective is to get us talking, get us conversing, get us dialoguing about the things that really matter in our society, the things that are going to move the needle. I, you know, I oftentimes think about the smallest mind are those that always are talking about people, right? And then kind of the average mind are for people that have talked about what has happened. But the greatest mind is for those who talk about what they're going to do, what's going to happen in the future, what they want the future to look like. And so I'm trying to grow big brains on the James Galliard Show. And so happy Monday. Happy Monday to everyone except the people who didn't go to church yesterday. Where are those people at? You know, in my real, my my day life, all the rest of the time, I'm a pastor, and I pastor Word Tabernacle Church, and we start every segment on Monday with uh, a segment I call, he said what? And so he said what is that segment where we talk about what your pastor said, what your man of God, you know why that D is there if you listened to the show last week, that what, what your man or woman of God uh, says. And so I'm taking calls today um, just in case I'm ruffling some feathers. I'd love to get your feedback. Uh, 919, if you're in the 919, 872 9210, and if you're in the 252-937-7400, I'm here to talk about things that are going to get us talking about greater issues. And if you know me, I like to weave politics into all of it. And so, hey, but what he said, he said, what? What was? What did your preacher, what did your pastor preach about? You know, life is too short for us not to be challenged spiritually, to not be challenged intellectually to not be challenged emotionally. I don't know about you. I want to be a better version of me. And for that reason, I go to church every week, right? Not because I'm just the guy that's preaching, but because I really want to be challenged and sharpened by the other people that are there. And so I talked a little bit yesterday about, about God exceeding our expectations and how God is always at work in our lives. And I want to encourage somebody, even before we jump into today, today's show, I want to encourage someone that God is indeed at work in your life. He is indeed at work in your situation. Here's the thing about God, though. I was in a passage of Scripture of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, and 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 he the stone removed. He told the people, "Hey, remove the stone." And then Jesus stood outside the sepulcher, and he said, "Lazarus, come forth." And what was interesting is that he didn't go in and get Lazarus. He required Lazarus to make a move himself. And I want to encourage somebody today about that, that God may be waiting for you to make a move. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and trust God and make that move. And so that's what I talked about. I'm going to be checking the Facebook posts as well. And so if you've got a question for me today, I'm going to take your question. I'm going to check at the break. And if you have a question out there, I'm going to do my best to entertain that question. And so what did we do? The second segment I always like to talk about is what we did while we were away from each other. And so while we were away from each other at last, I attended a couple of events that I want to get your lens on. I want us talking about, want to get us engaging about. And so one of the first things that I did last week before, when we were uh, not together is I attended a public safety roundtable with um, our chief of police here in Rocky Mount. And there was a question that was raised. And if you're anything like me, you have to be somewhat concerned about this gun culture that we live in. I think a lot of times people are looking for these easy solutions to gun violence when the reality of it is we live in the OK Corral. We live in an environment where lots of people have access to weapons and to guns. And, and as you know, I'm not an anti-Second Amendment guy. I think we have uh, in, incorrectly interpreted the Second Amendment. You know, I think everybody should be able to get a single shot, you know, rifle, no problem. You know, you can shoot one shot at a time, but 
you know, these assault rifles and all that. That's a whole nother conversation. But here's the question today. What do you think are some of the biggest factors that lead to the current rate of firearm-related incidents? What is it that you think leads to the increase in violent crime in our community? And, you know, I jotted down a couple things. I wanted to lay out for you some of my thoughts, and I, I don't know. I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are before I jump into too many of mine. But for those of you that are just jumping on, this is James Galliard, and this is the James Galliard Show. In the 919, you can reach me at 872 9210 in the 252, you can reach me at 937-7400 or on social media on Facebook. You can go ahead and type in your question. If you're listening in from another city or state, let us know where you're listening in from or whatever city. Even if you're here in North Carolina, I'd love to know. Are you in Raleigh or Durham or Rocky Mount, Tarboro? I'd love to know. Elm City, uh, where are you listening from? Scotland Neck, uh, Whitakers or Enfield. I'd love to know where you're listening from because i like to know where our, our loyal listeners are coming from. And so... This is the talk show every Monday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. where we talk about things that matter and things that are going to move our community forward, where we're not necessarily here to agree on everything that was said, but we're here to jog, if you will, a greater conversation. And so today we're beginning our show with a public safety discussion and about the incidents of firearm-related incidences and violent crimes in our communities. And the question posed was, what do you think are the factors? And so I laid out a couple of factors. I love to get your thought. I think for me, one of the factors is a lack of hope. I think that we have men and women, particularly young men, and particularly young black men who are really lacking hope, who have really gotten to a point of having given up and don't really see other avenues and other opportunities. And don't really see any benefit to a full expression of their frustrations beyond uh, damaging, killing, harming someone that looks a lot like themselves. And the issue that's interesting is that lack of hope doesn't come strictly from within ourselves. That lack of hope comes from other contributing factors. And I think those are the things that we ought to be concerned about in, a, in our community. I think what, what are some of those some of those some of those issues. Well, I think one is, and if you have been listening or watching our show, you know that for me, there is often a theme around public education. I think that when you spend this many hours with a child, you know, six to eight hours every day, um, there's no way that your involvement and intentionality with them is not going to be uh, significant or the lack thereof for that matter. And I got to thinking about that young person, I don't know, that is, say, 16 years old, and they've been attending a public school, say, since they were six years old. I think I started first grade at five years old, but say six years old, they, they went into a first grade classroom or a kindergarten classroom, and they stayed there and say until they were 15 or 16 years old, which means they stayed there about 10 years. They didn't finish. They... Um, dropped out in 10th or 11th grade because they got really frustrated with school. And I got to thinking um, they were reading subpar reading level. You know, they were stuck at a fourth or fifth or sixth grade reading level and uh, just really frustrated with the educational system. So for me, one of the things that attributes contributes to this issue of public safety and the factor that leads into our current firearm-related incidences is just poorly funded public schools. You know, think about it. This young man who's 15, 16 years old has has actually never attended in his life or in her life a school that was properly funded by the state of North Carolina, even though there is embedded in our state constitution. You know, remind me, remind me in a future show that I might pull out my constitution. Literally, if I had my backpack in studio with me, if I had my backpack you would, in the zipper compartment of the front of my backpack, I keep a North Carolina constitution. I, we, we need to, I know it's going to probably be boring for some of us, but we need to really understand what our rights are. We need to understand what the constitution says. We need to have a conversation around civics and so that we can really fully um, understand and engage other people. And even though the state constitution places in it a requirement that every child would have a sound basic education, and yet for that young person that we did not constitutionally 
And that's a good word for all my constitutionalists and all of my my far right leaning friends. And let me be very clear. I don't I don't tag myself a conservative. I don't tag myself liberal because I think when you when you enter when you start out in that conversation, you already are being disingenuous. You've already then begun attaching your identity to a position where you don't even know what the issue is. And so there are some issues that I'm very conservative on. But there are other issues that I'm far more liberal on, and there's some even yet that I'm moderate on. And so be careful of the language. I'm always, my antenna goes up, and I get nervous. I, don't, I would say I have hair on my back, but that's like really yuck, yuck, nasty. I'm sorry. Maybe I should have said good afternoon to everybody except for folk with hair on their back. But I, that's one thing I don't have is hair on my back. But So I don't like that expression, you know, it makes your hair on your back stand up because I'm like, who has hair on their back? But anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. But it, it makes me concerned when people want to immediately identify themselves with a position before they've not even heard the issue. And so I don't tag myself liberal or conservative or moderate, um, but I do know that I have people listening because some of I've been getting text messages from various people saying, you know, you got some some of your conservative friends are a little bit upset. I'm like, well, good. They need to be upset because they've done enough to halfway destroy our country and certainly our state. So, yeah, you get to be upset a little bit. And so to some of my more conservative friends that want to live by the rule of the Constitution, I'm not mad at you. I would just simply say to you, if the Constitution says, and it does, by the way, that we need to provide every child a sound basic education and we're not doing it, then how do you propose that the lack of hope and the systemic issues that have risen up as a result of that not meeting that basic constitutional right, how do you then not see that you are complicit, that you are responsible in how that young person now is living out their life? And so the answer to the question for me around the firearm-related incidents and violent crime, I think, again, first of all, is a lack of hope. I think, secondly, is poorly funded schools, as I've argued time and time again on this show. And I will continue to um, all, um, all argue time and time again on this show. Um, speaking of public education, let me just, you know, shift gears. I haven't planned on going here for a moment. But, you know, we are in the midst of an election cycle. We have a general election coming up in November. And one of the positions that's going to be on ballot is for superintendent of public instruction. Uh, that is the individual who that is the individual who will be responsible for overseeing an eleven billion dollar budget in our state. Uh, the, the Democratic candidate for that position is a well qualified candidate by the name of Mo Green, Maurice Green, former school superintendent, uh, lead counsel and uh, advisor in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, and so been intimately involved in two of the three largest school systems in our state. And then there's Michelle Morrow. <laughs> Have y'all been following Michelle? <laughs> First of all, it, it's strike, striking to me that a person who, who homeschools their child wants to run public education. That's just, as I told you before, it's like you want to run my church, but you don't go to church. That's why folks who have all these opinions about church, you don't really get to express them unless you go to church. The way you get to weigh in on issues, family, is participate in the institution that you have an issue about. Single folk don't get talked to me about marriage, right? And marriage folk, married folk don't have nothing to say about singleness. Stay in your lane. And so if you don't have experience in a certain area, I don't know what it's like to breastfeed. I don't know what it's like to give birth to a baby. I've not done that before. How is it possible that a human being that, that hates public education so much that they refuse to even educate their own child in the system suddenly wants to run the system that they don't believe in? The system that they... So listen to her. She's, they found some of her old tweets. So for my conservative friends out there, hello. What, do you, what say you on your candidate, Michelle Morrow? What say you? Listen, what say you to the woman who tweets about televising the execution of Barack Obama. What? Who does that? She's like, we should kill the president-elect, Joe Biden. Let me quote her directly so y'all don't, don't get it twisted. This is, this is the Republican candidate to run North Carolina public schools, y'all. This is what she said. I prefer a pay-per-view of him in front of the firing squad. 
some user responded uh, to a she responded to somebody on Twitter about a conspiracy theory uh, who suggested sending Obama to prison at Guantanamo Bay. So that was the context of the quote, because, you know, I'm a preacher and, you know, you, you don't take stuff out of context. That's just that's a fallacy. You know, when preachers do that, you know, you ever had that you go to church, they take a text. They don't never say anything about the text. Right. And so you, you can't do that with the scriptures. And so you shouldn't do, do that with anything. Like You need to put stuff in context. So like when somebody says to you, somebody said this or somebody said that, well, can you put that in context for me? Why did they say that? What was the conversation like? And so Michelle Morrow is responding to a tweet about Barack Obama and about the whole conspiracy theory. The person says we should send Obama to prison at Guantanamo Bay. And she says, I do not want to waste another dime on supporting his life. We could make some money back from televising his death. With my conservative friends, um, 919, if you're in the 919, I'd love to get your position on that. Um, tell me how you support that candidate. 919-872-9210, if you're in the 919, if you're in the 252 937 7,400, because I got on this whole issue of public education. And so, you know, in, in a different post in 2020, she responded to a fake Time magazine cover that featured the featured art of, of, of Obama in an electric chair, asking if she he should be executed. And this is what she said, death to all traitors. I mean, this is a person who wants to oversee the state's public school system. This is the person who wants to set educational priorities. This is the person who wants to manage the school system's budget. This is the person who wants to work with the State Board of Education to set and implement curriculum standards. And she is tweeting out foolishness like that. And so, you know, some, some elections should just be easy. They have to go beyond race. They have to go beyond party affiliation. And they just need to go to whoever the superior candidate is. And so, yeah, I'm blaming public schools as a reason, a potential factor that leads to the current rate of firearm-related incidents and violent crime. So what's on your list, G? Um, lack of hope is on my list. Poorly funded schools is on my list. But let me be an equal opportunist here. Because let me tell you about the James Gellier Show. And this is the James Gallier Show. If you're tuning in, I am your host, James Gallier. I get to hang out with you for one hour every Monday. If y'all really like me, this one hour could become two. This one day could become two. You gotta let, you gotta let, you know, the powers that be. You gotta let Chuck Johnson and the powers that be at Choice FM know if you really like what I'm talking about. You want to hear more of it, and so I love to get on the radio a little bit more with you and talk some of this stuff that we're talking about. The kind of to kind of churn through some of our thought processes. And so I'm an equal opportunist in the sense that I'm just coming for truth, right? And whoever is whoever is hiding truth, whoever is trying to, to keep truth from being covered, uncovered, then, then that's the person I'm coming for. The person that is speaking damaging and defamating things against our society, that's the person I'm coming for. So this is not a black, white thing. It's not a Democrat, Republican thing. Um, this is like I'm trying to tell the truth and I'm trying to challenge us regarding truthful things in our society. So having said that, I want to raise this up. Here's the third factor for me about um, what is leading to the current rate of firearm related incidents. I'm going to say family deterioration, family deterioration. If we were if we were playing a game show, I wonder if if family few would show up. It, um, let the survey say uh family ter deterioration. I, I, you know, I grew up, and I think there are a lot of reasons for this. I think in some regard, our society and our systemic problems, and I'm going to speak to systemic problems in a moment, I think our society and some of our systemic problems really lend themselves to the deterioration of family. You know, when a man is incarcerated, he is paroled or released from prison, and his family struggles in his absence, he finally is released to be returned to his family. Could be to his wife, it could be to his girlfriend and their child or his wife and their child. But she's living in public housing because she had to live somewhere while he was trying to get his life back together and paying his time. But then society says, 
well, you can't have a person that's on parole or has a certain type felony or classification living in the house with you, even if it's your spouse, right? So we have some of those kinds of systemic issues that do contribute to the deterioration of the family. But let's face it, y'all, you know, my parents, they, they didn't have the perfect marriage, but they had a marriage. And they didn't agree on everything, but they agreed on raising me. They agreed on having standards for me. They agreed on having a village surrounding me that would hold me accountable and discipline me. And I think that we are lacking big mamas and big daddies again. I think we are lacking environments where we have real accountability, real love, real structure, real discipline. I mean, we live in a culture now where, you know, you spank a child, man, and, you know, Department of Social Services is coming for you, childhood protection. And listen, don't don't send me, don't, don't do it. Do not send me that whole email about me advocating for child abuse. That That's not what this was about. It's just me saying that sometimes a child does need to be disciplined appropriately. And I think we live in a society now where we have gotten away from accountability. We've gotten away from discipline. We've gotten away from standards. We have deteriorated to a point where men are now afraid of boys, where when I was growing up, boys were afraid of men. And, you know, we have to speak to that situation that that it, it is best when there's a mom and a dad in the house raising a child. It is best when the whole community is functioning as a village and can take on the part of disciplining our children. And so I do believe that this issue of family deterioration um, is a contributing factor as to the increase. What say you? It, it, what is on your list? You know, go ahead and put it in chat. I'll read it when we take a break in a few moments. But what say you? What do you think are the biggest factors? Let me give give you two or three more, and then and then we'll get ready for our first break. So for me, it is a lack of hope. It is poorly funded schools. It is family deterioration. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say gun laws. I'm gonna say gun laws. You know, we still have some very loose gun laws. You don't even have to apply anymore for a permit with the sheriff's department. The General Assembly in this last session came up with that brilliant idea. Don't really know whose brilliant idea that was. Hey, you know what? Get a gun. You don't need to get any, you know, you don't have to get any okays from anybody. It's your it's your right to go get a Glock, you know, that shoots, four, that's got 14, 15 bullets in the clip, and you can just cl clatter off whenever you want. That's your right. Um, you know, our gun laws are just too loose. And, you know, something is wrong when we allow these lobbyists, you know, and we allow these associations like the NRA or whatever the case may be, um, the National Rifle Association, whatever gun advocacy groups are out there, literally controlling. Like, we, our, our, our guns have more laws defending them than our children do. Our our gun, the, the gun in your cabinet, the gun at my house, the gun that I keep on my person, my Glock, my Glock 43X, it it has more laws protecting it than a woman does in the midst of domestic violence, than a child does in the midst of abuse. And so something is fundamentally wrong with that. I'm James Galliard. This is the James Galliard Show. I'm live every Monday from 5 to 8 p.m. right here on Choice FM. If you want to catch us on the dial, it's Choice FM 92.1. If you want to catch us on the Internet, it's ILoveChoiceFM.com. If you just want to catch us on social media, jump onto my social media at J.D. Galliard or on Choice FM. This is the People Station, and this is where we talk not to get everybody to agree but we talk to get everybody to think and how we talk about things that really matter. You want to call in on the 919, it's 872-9210. And in 252, it's 937-7400. I am James Galliard. We're going to take a quick commercial break. I'm going to check your media messages, and we will be right back. Wing, yummy spaghetti, and the first pizza to ever be served 
downtown Rocky Mountain. Hot, delicious pizza and more at Pops Diner. Pops Diner for hot dogs. Pops Diner for lunch. Open daily from 11 till 7 p.m. City workers get the Pops hookup. Pops Diner. Open from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Wings, pizza, burgers, spaghetti. congregations. That's according to a report that was released back in January. The report called Understanding the Pandemic Impact on Black and Multiracial Congregations was funded by the Lilly Endowment and led by researchers at the Hartford Institute for Religion Research. It found stark disparities in how the pandemic affected churches of different racial makeups. One of the key findings of the report underscores the financial strain experienced by black churches. Between the summer and fall of 2021, majority black congregations witnessed a significant downturn in their financial stability compared to their white and multiracial counterparts. For AURN News, I'm Jamie Jackson. The James Gellier Show on Choice FM. My people, we are back. I get, Look, I have a caller um, from Rocky Mountain. I'm going to take her in one second. But let me just say this. I'm laughing. You know, forgive me because I just heard that news segment, right? And they're like, the Lilly, I think it was the Lilly Foundation. The Lilly Foundation has funded a special study uh, to show that African-American congregations were disproportionately impacted by COVID. What? So you had to spend money for that? <laughs> All you had to do was go worship at a black church, sir. We would have been happy to help show you the proof of your data. That cracks me up all the time where people do these studies of things that we already already know are the case. And nine times out of ten, I've not read the study, but nine times out of ten, probably very few people in the black community or the black church were even kind of embraced around the study. I just think it's kind of crazy. I know we need data, empirical data, to make good decisions and inform our decision making, and I'm all in, I'm at all out advocate of that. But I think sometimes we are funding studies for the sake of saying we funded studies when all the evidence is kind of intuitively there to begin with. But anyway, I have a caller. I'll take you. Uh, hey there, I think it's Teresa. You are on the James Gallier show. What's on your mind? Hey. Um I just want to say that I agree with what you were saying about um, deteriorating from families. I feel like we we have lost a lot of structure in this generation, and I feel like that can help because what, what kids do at home, they do at school. Mm. So everything falls into play. So I feel like if we gain a little bit more structure, then at home, that'll help at school. That'll yeah. help when the kids are out in public. Yeah, that's that'll a, help them how to act when they're at a basketball game or when they're out at any other public event. Uh, Teresa, you know, I could everything starts at home. Look, that's it. And I have an expression, yeah. Teresa, and thanks for your call today. And make sure you call in again real soon. I'll comment on Teresa while she hangs up. But Lisa, let me say this about Teresa's comment. She's right. She's spot on. I have an expression. Um, whatever doesn't start at the home doesn't usually start. And opposite to that the things that usually start at home get perpetuated in other places like they jump up and down on your furniture out in the public because they jump up and down your furniture at home and so she used the terminology structure and I think that part of what's going on with the deterioration of family in my opinion is that parents are different you know like I see parents who need to get disciplined <laughs> And I think oftentimes, so we live in a culture now where, you know, I, I grew up where my, my parents were like, we, I'm not your friend. Like, I'm not your little friend. You know, you're not going, we're not going to sit down and smoke weed together. Like, that ain't happening. We're not having, we ain't drinking no liquor together. You ain't going to cuss with me. Like, that's just not happening. 
And so we have this society now, I think, where, you know, parents are so busy being our friends that, and look, I understand we need outlets, we need people to talk to, all that good stuff, but... Um, she's right. Teresa's right. I appreciate the call. This is James Galliard. Um, this is the James Galliard Show. We're together every Monday. I don't know what God is going to do with this little show that we're starting, but I'm loving it. And I'm loving the fact that people like Teresa are calling in. Um, if you're in the 919-872-9210, and listen, I can handle being disagreed with. You know, it's fine. I'm, I, I, I think it's going to be hard to because I'm going to come for you with real data but I'm here for whatever comment people want to make. If you're in the 252-937-7400, we're talking about public safety. We're talking about what creates the factors leading to current rates of firearms. And so we started with lack of hope. We talked about poorly funded schools. We talked about family deterioration, of which we got a check mark from Teresa in Rocky Mount, who's like, yeah, I'm in agreement with that. Our homes need a little more structure. And if we try a little bit more structure, we'd be surprised. You know, I... I'm going. I'm going to get. I'm going to get some pushback on this, but I do think sometimes, like raising a child, can be different when you're young. You know, like unless you yourself was raised by somebody old school, I do see situations. And I'm speaking generally, because you know, obviously there are exceptions to what I'm saying, but oftentimes when the parents raising the children are themselves young. And they did not grow up with old school parenting. Like I, I was, I became a dad at 21, but I had old school parents, right? Mom and dad were real old school. And so I grew up with kind of an old school mentality and old school spirit. I think that's different than a 21 year old, 18 year old, 17 year old having a baby, working out the whole parenting situation. But then their parent was 15 when they were born. And so now you have a grandmama, a granddaddy at 31, 32, 33 years old. That's, that's, that creates a really difficult kind of culture. And, of course, there are exceptions to that. But generally speaking, I think that's true. So gun laws, family deterioration, poorly funded schools. And here's something else I want to lay out. Lack of exposure. I think that when people lack exposure, they don't really know what they can be. They don't really know what they can become. They don't really understand what the possibilities are and what the scenarios are. I, I always give the example, and people that are part of my congregation have heard me give this example, but for those of you that are in Raleigh and Durham and uh, Nightdale and Zebulon and Roseville and all of these different places, uh, Roanoke Rapids, Pine Tops, Whitaker's Enfield, Tarboro, where my people, Greenville, maybe have not heard me say this, but like there is no escalator in the city of Rocky Mount. I pastor a church in Rocky Mount. I live in Rocky Mount. There is no escalator in Rocky Mount. And so a child who is being asked what an escalator is, it's hard to answer that question at one year old or two years old or three years old because they've never seen one if they've not been to Raleigh or some other place. And I think a lack of exposure really is hurting our society because we have a whole generation of young people that don't really understand what they can be. They don't understand what the possibilities are. They don't understand how God can open doors for them. And so that leads really to another part of this question. I hadn't planned on spending so much time on public safety, but hey, we're here. And for those of you that are just tuning in, I'm James Galliard, and this is the James Galliard Show live every Monday on Choice FM, 92.1 FM. I love choicefm.com. Um, or you can tune in on Facebook, either I Love Choice FM Facebook or my Facebook, James Gailyard, J.D. Gailyard. We're talking about the biggest factors leading to current rates of firearm-related incidents and violent crimes. And we talked about poorly funded schools. We talked about education in general. And we talked about Michelle Morrow, that, whew, that wild candidate, Republican candidate for North Carolina school superintendent. She's wild, y'all. Um, and you can listen to the beginning of the show. I'm not going to repeat all that foolishness. Um, we talked about family deterioration, gun law, social determinants of health. I'm not going to get into de details of that. But, you know, again, when people grow up in an environment where they lack clean water and clean air, uh, where there are environmental factors, where they don't have access to healthy foods, when they don't have walking trails, when they don't have the ability to work out, when they don't have access to gymnasiums and recreation facilities, 
all of that leads to poor health. And the lack of poor health then uh, lends itself to not being able to attend school with regularity. It, it lends itself to unhealthy behaviors. It lends itself to depression. It lends itself to pain. And before you know, individuals are peeling off into their own subset of society, their own underground world, where they take on a whole different persona and personality just out of pure desperation and frustration of their life. Um, and then there's the systemic inequities. You know, just how unequal our systems have been, not just for 10 years or 20 years, but for generations. And I don't have time to get into all those details, but there are systemic inequities in every system of our society. There are systemic inequities as it relates to maternal birth, a child, maternal mortality, and how uh, women of color are disproportionately represented in terms of maternal mortality. Like they're more likely to die giving birth than a white woman. Something's fundamentally wrong with that. When you leave Wake County, I have Wake County listeners. Thank you for listening to the James Gallier Show. Um, when I have Wake County listeners, I have Wake County people. When you leave Wake County, you start going down Highway 64. It's mm, about to become something else now. Um, was it 587 or 87 or 57, something? Um, but when you leave Wake County, you start driving east and you get into uh, Nash County, Edgecombe County, Martin County. Actually, you have a little, little well, hot little minute. You're in Franklin. So you go Wake and then Franklin and then Nash and then Edgecombe and then Martin. So you go five counties deep. And the life expectancy decreases by two years every time you hit a new county. So when people think that systemic inequities are not real, you explain to me how a child, a male child or a female child can be born in Martin County on the exact same day to parents born in Wake County. And that child born in Martin County is going to live 10 years less than a child born in Wake County. And so we see example upon example in every scenario, in every situation. That's why people move into different communities, oftentimes for public education. When you, when you look at housing, um, uh, housing announcements, housing displays, housing advertisements, listings, right, real estate listings, and you see a house for sale, and you keep scrolling through and they give you information on the property. They don't just give you information on the number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, and they give you information on the community. And part of the information they give you on the community is the school district. And then oftentimes there are links or other data to those school district links to be able to tell you, you know, what type of school system that is because there are systemic inequities. 87, thank you, Melissa. So as you go down Highway 87... And so, um, so there are systemic inequities. So the first issue I would say is those are the factors leading to the current rate of firearms. But because this is the James Gallier Show, we want to offer solutions, want to offer hopes to you. And so the second part of that roundtable on public health with the police chief and other community members that I participated in, and I guess I'm going to wind up with almost a whole show on this because I had so much other stuff to talk about is they ask the question, what are some bright spots? What are some bright spots? What are some potential ideas for solutions? I want to offer a little bit of that. I want you to think about that for a moment. What do you see as potential opportunities for solutions? My educators that are out there really be interested in what you have to say about this. What do you see as potential? And if you're on social media, I'll be able to listen, watch in on Facebook, and I can comment on what you're saying on air. Um, if you don't want to call in, but what do you see as bright spots? What do you see as potential ideas for solutions? Well, for me, I'm going to say a couple things. I think one thing that we need to do is we need to have a higher, a, a heavier emphasis on trades. I really, I want to shout out OIC and their trades program. I want to shout out our community college system. We have um, 58 community colleges in our state. Um, in, in our listening area now, we have what? Nash Community College, Edgecombe Community College, Wake Tech, uh, Johnson County Community College, um, Halifax Community College. And so those are the ones I know for sure. Probably Durham Tech as well. 
are all in our listening area. And so I do think that we have to place a heavier emphasis on trades. You know, we 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 uh, outfitted a former Home Depot building. It's 110,000 square feet. And I'll tell folk, every time we spend a million dollars, and we spend about 13 of those million dollars, but every time we spend another million dollars developing out our building, 75 to 80 percent of those dollars were spent on a person without a college degree. Pretty much the only people that we spent money on that had degrees were our architects and our engineers. So our architect and then our mechanical, plumbing, electrical engineers and our site engineers, we spent money on them. But the rest of the money was was spent on people without a degree. Right. It was spent on somebody that knew how to saw, cut a floor. It was spent on somebody that knew how to weld. It was spent on somebody that knew how to uh, sheetrock. They knew how to finish sheetrock. They knew how to paint. Uh, They knew how to run wiring. They uh, knew how to install mechanical systems. It was so, you know, 75 percent of the money was spent on that group of people. And we struggle with finding those contractors because folk don't know how to do anything anymore. You know, when I was coming up, even though I went to a school for academically gifted children, we still had shop, woodwork, those kinds of things. And so we still were required to do things with our hands. And so I think an emphasis on trades is really important. Um, LaShawn Jenkins is with us. He's a principal at Patillo in Tarboro. Thanks for listening. I know you tend to listen, so I appreciate that support. He's talking about community partnerships, and he's talking about internships while in middle and high school. I, let me let me lean in on that, internships on middle and high school. When I was, I saw Brenda Jenkins. I don't know if she's still on, if she's still watching. When I was in high school, we had a program called the AFNA program. It's It stood for AFNA, the American Foundation for Negro Affairs. And the AFNA program provided access routes to careers in medicine and law and engineering. I believe they added at some point as well. I know when I was an AFNA scholar, it was medical and law. And it gave us from high school opportunity to be exposed. Matter of fact, my first jobs were in healthcare because I was in the pre-health component of the AFNA program. And so... I was running ambulances as an EMT when I was in high school. I was I was doing electrocardiograms in the cardiology department of the hospital when I was in high school. And so I think providing young people, as LaShawn has said, with internships while they're in middle and high school, I think are so key. I think we can do that relatively inexpensively. Many of our young people, but let me say something about this, because this is where another example of systemic inequities pops up. Where it pops up is oftentimes in wealthier communities and in some in those situations, many times they're white communities. And many times in those communities, there's enough income, enough wealth, enough comfort that their children can volunteer and take volunteer internship opportunities. A lot of times, and we particularly see this in college situations, but a lot of times with our high school students and even some middle school students, depending on the age, they have to get a they gotta get a job where they're getting some kind of income to sub support and to supplement what's going on in the family, and so they don't have the ability. So we don't just need to internship these children; we need to pay internship these children. So they need to be paid internships, and I agree, we need to get them in the middle school level. We need to get them in the high school level and give them exposures to the trades, exposure to, and let me just be clear, not just the trades, because in as much as every child is not going to go to a four-year university, I also know that every child is not going to take on a trade. So the key to it is to give children enough exposure so they get legitimate choices. It is amazing to me, here I go on public education again. It is amazing to me that the advocates of pro-choice, right, school choice, the people that advocate for school vouchers, um, what they call now opportunity scholarships, the people who advocate for school choice in no way advocate for school choice. 
They simply advocate for their individual child getting a few extra dollars to go to a private school so they don't have to be attached to the rest of the kids. But if they really advocated for, for school choice, they would advocate that in communities, children would have opportunity to choose academic routes. They would have choices of trade routes. They would have choices of exposure around various um, professional degrees, whether it's engineering or law or accounting. They would have an entrepreneurship track. And so I really think the solution, one of the solutions or some of the solutions or some of the potential bright spots for how we how we reverse the trend of these gun related related violences. And it's not just here in North Carolina. I mean, it's all over the United States. You know, I still have a lot of friends in Philadelphia and I see the, the tremendous amount of a crime that that we see in cities all over America. And I think that when young people have exposure, I mean, getting a CDL and having a, tra a trailer and being able to drive, I mean, those drivers make great money. Plumbers make great money. Uh, electricians, great money. Uh, welders, I don't know any person that works in the trades that's not well paid. And so I really think that, um, I really think that we need to give these children greater exposure to these trades and to access routes beyond a four-year degree. Let me say something else as a potential solution. And I see people like Lily Worsley watching who I know is on the Edgecombe County School Boards. So I appreciate all of these educators. And Sonia Small mentions Granville, Vance Granville Community College is also probably in our listening area. And so that is correct. And um, and Wayne Community College, I didn't list those as well. And she says maybe get students started in the apprenticeship in North Carolina. They can start an apprenticeship during their junior year. And so, so some programs are targeting students in the ninth grade. And so I really do think we're on one page here, one accord, where it's really incumbent upon us to give young people an opportunity early on. I think early exposure is key. Let me say something else, though. I think we have to destigmatize community college. You know, we have to understand that it is it is so okay to do your first two years at home, full time student at Edgecombe or at Nash or at Johnson or at Durham or wherever the case is, Halifax Community College. Um, get that two year associate's degree. Also, here in North Carolina. You have the opportunity. I mean, we budget in state dollars in support of our community college systems where you don't have to attend an early college program. You can attend and take college credits at the community college while you're a student in high school. And so many students have the ability to still graduate from high school with some college credits. And so I think those begin to be some of the solutions that perhaps we can employ as we try to stem the issue of violence in our community, um, Chauncey says, I agree, Pastor, the communities need more positive attractions, something that our youth can be drawn to that's going to educate them and give them the opportunity to grow without education and growth. They can be distracted by the world system, and that's deceiving them because they're more interested in what they're seeing on television. So well said, Chauncey, and I agree. And let me say something else to this. This is something we need to do a better job of as adults. We have to learn to celebrate academic efforts. We have to celebrate academic efforts. Um, you know, how many people are in attendance at the spelling bee compared to the number of people in attendance at a basketball game or the number of people in attendance at a football game compared to the number of people that are participating in an oratorical contest. I mean, every year in great numbers, we participate at Word Tabernacle Church with our youth in the Martin Luther King Oratorical Contest. And with the exception of parents that generally are present with a grandmother, grandfather, some extended family member in support of their child that is participating, I mean, there are a few exceptions, but not many. Um, that's really who's in the room. But as a community, we don't embrace children that write well that speak well, that articulate themselves well, that test well. We don't do a great job of lifting them up as examples and, and celebrating them. And so what we, we do 
is we then wind up creating a culture that if I'm going to get clapped for, if I'm going to be shown up for, if I'm going to be cheered on, then I need to be in a uniform. I need to be a cheerleader, a football player, a basketball player. And we've got to learn to celebrate as a community, you know, gift cards. We just recently gave gift cards to our young people because of their participation in the oratorical contest and their participation just doing other things to serve people in our community. And so I do think that we need to lift that up. For those of you that are just tuning in, I'm James Galliard, and this is the James Galliard Show. I air every single Monday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. right on Choice FM 92.1 on your FM dial. You can also find me on Facebook, on their Facebook page, or on my personal Facebook page where we we broadcast this out to. And I'm the guy that just talks about things that gets us talking about other things that matter. And today we've spent our entire show, for the most part, talking about public safety. And we're talking about what the factors are that lead to our current rate of firearms. And now we're talking about what are some of the bright spots? What are some of the potential ideas for solutions? And you guys have been helping me out. Um, We said an emphasis on trades. And we said um, access routes and early exposure. And um, I'm going to come back and finish up this conversation. Joseph Beach just said learning to teach children differently could help. Instead of making our children um, regurgitate information and take standardized tests, create a system that looks at how a child learns. I could not agree with you more. We're going to talk a little bit about that when we come back. I'm James Gellier. This is the James Gellier Show. Thanks for hanging in with me. We have to pay a few bills, so here's a commercial break, and I'll be right back for our last segment. The James Gellier Show on Choice FM. Tomorrow on North State Bank's The Breakfast Club. Ray J is still here. I've really been, like, in the room for, like, four months building out some dope content. I'm so excited. I told people, I am the Ratchet Shakespeare. Oh, I like oh, I like that. You no, know, it is. I don't. And, and and what? <laughs> I don't like okay. that at all. That sounds ridiculous, Ray J. Okay. Ratchet Shakespeare. <laughs> ratchet Shakespeare. I, well, li- I like it. Well, break that down. Like what is the Ratchet Shakespeare? Maybe I need to see it first. Maybe I'm judging. You know what I mean? But uh, do you guys have time today to watch the sizzle? Absolutely. How long yeah, is the sizzle? How long is the sizzle? It was like, a, like two minutes. Of course. Oh, absolutely. Two minutes. He is really selling it. I really want to see it. Like, no, 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 no. Guy, no. Guy, Here's damn. what's crazy, y'all. I don't have to sell this. Right. There's nothing better. Mm, oh, my God. And walk off. Like, yo, source awards. NorthStateBank.com. First time home buyers. Our passion is helping you realize your dream. Apply online at NorthStateBank.com or call 919 614 9178. North State Bank. Better every day. Pops Diner, 132 South Church Street, Rocky Mount. Juicy burger, hot, delicious wing, yummy spaghetti, and the first pizza to ever be served downtown Rocky Mount. Hot, delicious pizza and more at Pops Diner. Pops Diner for hot dogs. Pops Diner for lunch. Open daily from 11 till 7 p.m. City workers get the Pops hookup. Pops Diner. Open from 11 a to 7 p. Wings, pizza, burgers, spaghetti, salads, and more. Hot. Fresh and fast at Pop Downtown Rocky Mountain. Open 11 8 to 7 p. Monday through Saturday. What's better, food shipped from thousands of miles away or locally grown? The answer is simple. Local is better. North State Bank is a local, independent bank created to serve Wake County with accounts and loans designed for our community in mind. Call, click, or come by one of our local offices to find out how we can serve you. Learn more at NorthStateBank.com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lending. Liberty Mutual Insurance Company presents... And Doug. And we're back with Limu, Emu, and Doug for the final question. Category is... Things you climb. All right, Lemu, what do you think? You sure? We're going with Liberty Mutual customizes your car insurance so you only pay for what you need. Oh, so close. We were looking for stairs. Huh. Only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 Liberty. The James Gellier Show on Choice FM. Welcome back, my people. Hey, listen, this is James Gillia. We're wrapping up. We've got five or six minutes left. But you know what jumped out for me today on the show? Maybe it's been happening in other shows and I've just been missing it. But our solutions are in our own communities. The solutions are in our own communities. I'm looking at comments around getting children in the career and college promise dual enrollment program. 
getting children involved in apprenticeship and see the names of so many of these community colleges, talking about community partnerships. <clears throat> Y'all, this is what this show is all about. We, we don't have the luxury of entertaining ourselves 24-7. Um, there's got to be some time where we carve out where we are challenging our thinking, where we're looking at ideas and we're looking at concepts and we're looking at solutions. And that's one of the things that I'm attempting to do every Monday from five to six when we're together to come up with solutions. I want you to be a part of this conversation. And so call in or or type something in in the Facebook comments or send an email to me and say, hey, these are some of the things I'd love for you to talk about. And so we're wrapping up our show talking about what are the bright spots, what are the potential ideas for solutions. And we've talked about an emphasis on trade and trades. We've talked about excess routes and early exposure. And the key to that, I want to I want to throw out two more thoughts. And, and both of them are related to our boys, our males. And the one is really being serious about male mentoring programs. I know some of you are going to be a little upset because you're like, hey, what about the ladies? What about the girls? And it's not that I'm trying to exclude the young ladies in any regard, as, in any regard, and I don't have the data in front of me, but I can get it for you for a future show. But when you look at the data, um, all of the data points to that the real problem area in our society is with our males. And I think we're going to need... We're going to need a male mentoring program. I mean, a really robust one. I know we've got programs in churches, and we need as many of them as we can get, and communities and schools and boys and girls clubs and other programs in our communities. But we're going to have to be really, really serious about taking on. I know um, Mo DeLoach has a, a mentoring program here in our community, and I'm sure there are others as well. But we're going to need male mentoring programs, and I want to go a step deeper. I want to go a step deeper. We need all male schools. I know when I say that, I and I want to be clear, I'm a byproduct. I attended a all-male high school and an all-male college. And if something different happens in the culture and in the psyche of that student when they're in an environment where they can really focus in and be around other males. And I think we're going to need to look at that. We're going to need to look at solutions for that. We're going to have to work with our federal agencies and state agencies and local communities to figure out what indeed that looks like. And so and the last thing that I would throw out there is that we need to privately endow public schools. Um, you know, there's not a will right now for uh, for properly funding, you know, say Patillo. I say I say that because LaShawn is on the show um, watching today. But what a difference would it make if Patillo had, you know, a hundred million dollar endowment? you know, or a $50 million endowment. You know, if they had a $50 million endowment, I mean, I know you're saying that's just a crazy amount of money. It is a crazy amount of money. But we also have foundations and trusts that are in a position to help jumpstart those kinds of opportunities. Even if it was a $10 million fund, I mean, think about what it would mean for the school. They could spend 5% of that $10 million every year that would just come out of interest. You know, I'm reading a book right now on the power of foundations as a way of turning around the inequity in our society. It's called The Foundation. Um, and it's one of the best kept secrets about how we function in our society. But if that school had a $10 million endowment, that means, let me see, 10% of 10 million is what, 1 million, so 5% is $500,000. That $10 million endowment will give them access to $500,000 a year that they could use specifically at their local school. It could be used to supplement teacher salaries. It could be used to make capital improvements and equipment. And a lot of times we're throwing money into communities and we're not endowing those communities. And I really want to advocate that we do that in the future. And so, hey, this is James Galliard. I'm grateful that you've all been with me today. I'm out of time. I'm certainly not out of talk. I'm out of clock, but I'm not out of content. You know, I want to talk about Freak Nick. I want to talk about Holy Week. I want to talk about the NCAA men and women. I want to talk about the NC Rural Center and the Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, Steve Troxler. I want to talk about Faith and Housing Summit and initiatives. And I didn't get to any of that. And then I want to talk in greater detail 
about Leandro and school choice and all of that stuff, and I just didn't have enough time. So I'll be back next week. I want to close on a quote I heard last week that really blessed me. And here's the quote. Be humble on the mountaintop, be steadfast in the valley, and be faithful in between. One more time. Be humble on the mountaintop, be steadfast in the valley, and be faithful in between. I'm James Gallier. This is The James Gallier Show. You have a wonderful rest of your Monday. I will see you next week at this time. Peace out. The James Gallier Show on Choice FM. This is WRSV Elm City. Turn up. Choice FM.